I just want to say hi to everybody. Um, I'm sitting here in the fake WHO uh, cafe uh, with the flags. Uh, so greeting from all of us at WHO and a special greeting from the Director General, uh, Ted Ross, who you will have seen on the, on the television and in the news. He has nothing but extreme respect for midwives absolutely everywhere. And he really understands your value and how hard you work and just how incredibly um, important you are. And I feel that midwives don't always realize um, that they do save lives and that they are loved and treasured so much. And we don't often have the chance to say that given the circumstances um, that you're working in. So it's a real privilege to be able to actually talk to students because you are the future. It's not us sitting here um, in WHO, it's you who will take this forward. And really massive greetings to all of you in countries from all around the world, because that is so exciting and really pleased to be able to have you here. So we're going to show a very short film from Water Aid. Some of you may have seen it before. Please share it. But I just want, before I go into a roller coaster of information and challenges about global midwifery, take a deep breath. Imagine being in a really low income, low resource country with a woman who is extremely poor and you really don't have the resources or the education or the support that you need. And this film now, thanks Catherine, if you could put that up, is going to focus um, on um, the, the really essential issue of water um, during childbirth. So please enjoy this for a couple of minutes. film always just reminds me every time that it is the injustices of inequality that are driving us in this work. It is not right that in 2021 this situation um, exists and I know many of you online will experience that yourself and understand it. 
So that was the film. Please do watch it, share it. Uh, it's really seriously important. But I just wanted to start with by saying, you know, this is the inequality that we're facing. And this is the Lancet Maternal Health Series in 2016, that globally we have far too much going on. You look at the left-hand side, and I always hope that that was a much needed cesarean section. But in some states in India, for example, we're getting 73% cesarean section rates. That is not right, and it is dangerous. And on the other hand, here's a woman somewhere in Southeast Asia, possibly Nepal or Northern India, Bangladesh maybe, she's not getting any care at all. So we have a situation that I never thought that we would get into 30 years ago because we've been trying so hard to improve care and access to care. But actually the quality of care is so appalling that it's now a bigger barrier to reducing mortality than insufficient access to care. So if we look at this slide, this is from the Lancet Global Health Series, um, incredible. If you look at the first arrow, if you look at the blue part of that neonatal death graph, what it shows is that just over half of all neonatal deaths are now taking, part, taking place in a facility. So what's the point of coming into a facility if the care is so poor that your baby's going to die in the facility? So we haven't really addressed that issue at all. And if you look at the bottom red where it says maternal disease, which I object to because pregnancy is not a disease, but that's how they classified it. It's the same situation that women are coming into facilities but dying there because of the poor quality of care. And it's a real choice. Do I want to go into a facility where I might die? Why don't I just stay at home? So, you know, we really have to analyze carefully what kind of progress that we have been making. So this is a huge global challenge for us. I'm very glad that both um, Verona and Jackie mentioned the Lancet series of midwifery and that quality maternal newborn care framework, because we took from that, that in WHO, we developed the, this uh, picture I'm about to show that actually quality midwifery education and care improves over 50 health-related outcomes. And yet we don't see that that's being applied where there is this poor quality of care. So this is a summary of what we found in, in the paper one of the Lancet. You put midwifery in the middle. It helps women survive, thrive, transform communities, societies. Mortalities reduce maternal, neonatal, stillbirth, infant. I'm not going to read through all of this, but this is in a document I'm about to share. But harm to women and their newborns is reduced. Reduced maternal morbidity, incredibly important. Reduced PPH, eclampsia, reduced newborn preterm birth, low birth weight, hypothermia, hugely reduced by midwives. Improved psychosocial outcomes, less postnatal depression, less anxiety um, in labour, much better satisfaction with care. And therefore, this important issue that Jackie pointed out, the better immediate mother baby reaction, overall reduction of intervention, that is cost saving. Apart from anything else, it reduces infections. So more spontaneous birth, less augmentation, improved public health, breastfeeding, the first and most important public health initiative, reduced smoking, etc increased referrals for complications. So we have this data. We have to really use it now as policy with our ministries of health, the 194 flags that are, are behind me to make sure everyone understands and sees this. So what we did this year, um, coming out of the year of the nurse midwife, we are continuing to move forward. I like Neil saying it's mostly about the midwife. There was a lot on midwifery. It was brilliant. People did so well. But we developed the third state of the world's midwifery report, which was launched on International Day of the Midwife this year. And this is the Palais de Nation in Geneva, where the 194 member states, which means your Ministry of Health from your country and their entourage, if you like, they bring their ministers, their government chief nurse and midwifery officers, we hope. Um, but usually they're in teams of 10 to 20. So you can imagine how many people are here, plus all the donors, the Gates Foundation and the Global Fund, et cetera. And we all come together to talk about what are the health priorities for the future. We haven't been able to meet for two years. We really hope we'll be able to meet. Um, they've happened online, but it's not the same. Standing and talking to those ministers and people is really eye-opening and, and world-changing. And they set the global agenda for next year, and midwifery has been very, very high on that agenda. Now, what came out of the State of the World's Midwifery Report was two big things. We've been talking about, we don't have enough midwives. We need to train more midwives, train, train. That was quantity. We don't have enough, but we weren't talking quality. So there's been a real shift towards the quality, which I'm really pleased to see. Four big headlines. I'm going to take you through them in a little bit more detail, but education and training, leadership and governments, workforce planning, management, regulation, the things that Jackie and Rowan have just talked about, and a really positive environment to work in. And then really, I'm delighted to see this midwife-led improvements. 
Um, we didn't have to fight hard for that. There's a real welcome uh, for that now in many, many countries. So go into the State of the World's Midwifery Report. So it's a must. You'll see all the evidence. You'll see all the findings. You'll see all the data that was collected. It's, it's really brilliant. It's on the UNFPA and the WHO website. The headline is you cannot meet 90% of the need of women and newborns. Sexual and reproductive health is not just childbirth if you're less than 10% of the workforce. So this is what the data showed. And if you look at the bottom of those graphs, the darkest blue is how many midwives we've got. It's pathetic. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, why, are we, why is maternal mortality so high? It's just obvious. You just look at this graph. On the left, it's the six regions of the WHO, Africa, Americans, the Eastern Mediterranean, Europe, Southeast Asia, and Western Pacific. And you can see far less midwives than anyone else. And then on the right, it's, it's by income. So only 8% of this workforce are midwives. Um, and we really don't know how much time the others, the nurses and the doctors are spending on midwifery care. So we have a crisis if we want to improve um, our midwifery care. So I put the slide up because it kind of makes me think, why am I putting this slide up? Why are we even asking this question in 2021? Why do we have to explain why we have to invest in midwives? But we do. And that actually doesn't say something about ministries of health and what's going on in other countries. It says something about us. That at last now we have the evidence, but it took the Lancet series to take us forward. And now we've got much more, but we have got to get much better at advocacy based on evidence and not just on passion. Right. There are reasons why we need to do this that are good for ministries of health, good for ministries of finance, good for women, good for newborns that are good for society. And we need to get much better um, in our advocacy uh, and how we measure that. So this is a very important paper for all students to know and read. It is the latest and most important paper on midwifery that we developed for the State of the World's Midwifery Report. It's an update to the Lancet series in many ways. It's about the potential impact of midwives. So these are modelled estimates. This is not evidence in preventing and reducing maternal neonatal mortality. And we mustn't forget the stillbirths. They're a very important measure of what is going wrong. Andrea Nove led on this, and, and these are the authors. And please note... It was UNFPA plus WHO plus the ICM plus Burnett Institute and Metrics. We're really working together much better and more than we ever have done before. It's a joy now to work with all our partners. So what we did was identified 31 midwife delivered interventions that directed, uh, directly affected mortality and nutrition based on the global strategy for women, children, adolescent health. That's a WHO strategy and can be entirely delivered by a midwife according to the ICM standards. We used a tool called the LIST tool, Life Save tool. It's a, it's a, it's a very um, technical uh, numerical tool, so I won't go into detail on that, but we repeated it for modest scale up, substantial scale up, universal coverage, and we had to take into account attrition. This is one of the most important slides of 2021, and it's showing how many deaths can be averted if everything is there in place and we have midwives. On the left, you'll see universal health coverage, and Jackie, it was great to hear talk about we want universal coverage in the UK of all women. We could save 4.3 million lives a year by 2035 if that was in place as it is in the UK. You can look at the details yourself. If ministers only go for a 25% increase, which is challenging in countries, most of which do not have a card of midwives. Most countries just don't have the card of midwives that we have in the UK. You can still save 2.2 million lives a year by 2035. And even if you go, I'm just going to go for 10%, we're starting from zero, you can save 1.3 million lives a year of maternal, newborn and stillbirth. So I'm going to leave that for you to look at, but please do look at this paper. It's really important. We found that there are four high impact interventions that save most lives. And this is where we really have to focus in policy, uh, education, our faculty, training, uh, changing the system. So contraceptives, if midwives could give out oral contraceptives, injectables, long lasting family planning, we could avert half of all deaths. I came from Somalia before I was in WHO and access to family planning was less than 1%. Is it surprising that so many women and newborns are dying labour? It is crazy that that's what we have. Hypertensive disorder management to prevent stillbirths, antenatal corticosteroids, etc., to reduce Newborn deaths are very good to see the new newborn examination and hypertension screening management, parental role, neutrotronics. Most midwives, nurses in most countries are not able to give intramuscular injections. How on earth can they prevent 
postpartum hemorrhage. They can't even give oxytocin. Um, and, and that's to help reduce maternal death. So we have a lot to do to make sure those high impact interventions are part of the scope of practice. Training is there and they're regulated. It adds confidence, this paper, to the Lancet series. Many people questioned it. Oh, that was a one-off. That's just midwife. No, it wasn't. That was seriously good research. And now we have even more confidence, more detail, and more context. So that all went into the State of the World's Midwifery Report. I'm going to take you through now the four challenges, if you like. And I really want you to have your thinking hats on. You're the students. You're the future. I'm looking to you to see how we take this forward. Uh, we've got to invest, they're all invest in health workforce planning. There's a huge amount on this. I just want to highlight this slide. Not one out of the 194 countries submitted all of the data. We are so short of data on midwifery and what's going on. The countries that did submit much of the data didn't know the difference. And they couldn't distinguish in their data systems between a professional midwife and associate a nurse, a midwife, or a nurse midwife. We don't have those systems. And we don't know who's doing clinical practice, who's in research, and who's in education. Um, and there's no data on how much time nurses and others doctors, uh, provide to this area. So we need to get much better at that. This is a huge issue. I don't know how to answer this. It's in your hands as the future. But we know most midwives, 93% of women, most nurses are women, and half of doctors who work in this area are women. We need leadership opportunities. We need decent work, free from discrimination and harassment. And the gender pay gap has got to come to an end. And so we're talking about gender transformative policies and measures. Now, that is huge. It's just such a big topic. But we have to start thinking and raise our voices to what we want. What does that mean for us? It's not what a gender transformative policy means to some guy sitting in some you know, UN agency somewhere, us as midwives, what do we want to change in terms of gender transformative policies where we work? This is the effective regulation slide. I call it ineffective. If you look at the regulation again that Jackie was talking about, only one in three countries globally require relicensing. So you could have trained 30 something years ago and never had to relicense. So you are out of date, out of control and out of knowledge depth. And so we've got to do something to make sure we have continuing professional development and systems um, to enable continuing professional development. I'll let you look at these graphs more. So number two, education and training, absolutely critical. And as students, this is so important for you. If you just look at this, 49%, half of, half of all countries have educators who are midwives, which means half of all countries don't have any midwives who are educating midwives. So who's educating them if they're not midwives? And what are they educating them in? 6% of countries have no educators at all that are midwives. So they've been educated by other health professionals. So, you know, we have a huge challenge here to really get back to good quality education and to help midwives. So many times it's like, they don't know how to do this. They are not able to do this. Doctors say, we can't let midwives do that. Guess what? They were never educated to do that or they couldn't have access to clinical sites, or they get to clinical sites and there's no preceptorship, et cetera, et cetera. So what did we do? This all fed into the SOMI report. In 2019, led by member states, this was Sweden with Malawi, India, um, UK, um, just trying to think of the other countries. We had a whole event, apparently according to the cleaners, the best event that we ever had at the World Health Assembly on launching this a framework for action for strength and quality midwifery education. And I'm really pleased again to say we, WHO led on this, but we did it with UNFPA, with UNICEF, and with the International Confederation of Midwives. This is a jointly owned uh, document, and we are jointly implementing it globally. Very briefly, as you meet today, 810 women are dying in childbirth. Most of them will be at home and without any pain relief uh, whatsoever. 2.4 million newborns die every year. And every 16 seconds, there has been a stillbirth globally. These are estimates. And this is something that just makes me angry, actually. But one in five women in 2021 are giving birth without any help whatsoever. What does that say about the state of our planet and how much we care for the environment in which women um, are providing the next generations um, for our future? And as I mentioned, educators just don't have those competencies. They don't have materials. And half of all education institutes have no water and no toilets. How could you go to work there? And half of all facilities don't either. So we're, we're looking at really tough, challenging uh, scenarios. However, when I look at this photograph, which is Bangladesh, my heart feels great. I was there in the mid 80s and then again in the early 90s. 
it was awful. You look here, here's a midwife who knows what she's doing. She's got a companion at birth. The woman has been well cared for. She's allowed to walk. It's clean. Huge progress is being made in countries like Bangladesh. So, you know, huge appreciation to all the midwives who are breaking these boundaries and changing things. Never forget, because we tend to in countries where we're quite okay, that 60% of maternal deaths are taking place in fragile and conflict affected settings. Do you think of Syria, Yemen, all the countries that are in conflicts at the moment, it is desperate, um, and 5% of newborn mortality. And this is a photograph from Somalia. And you know, even there they have raised midwifery, it's become a great profession, they're doing a master's online course. So even in the most difficult circumstances, we can do something and midwives are always there. The doctors cannot always be there. So, so you know, Somalia, amazing. So we decided to stop just talking about this. And again, to stop just saying we need a better curriculum. Let's train more midwives. Let's have more curriculum. And we developed a seven step action plan. We put women and newborns in the center. We didn't put the midwife or the system or the government, women and newborns. And all of our partners, we said, we've got to have leadership before we move to the curricula. Let's have senior midwifery leadership and let's have policies that support education. Let's get the data and evidence, not just on maternal deaths and stillbirths, et cetera. But we don't really know what's going on about midwifery. Let's build public engagement and advocacy. Let's get doctors on our side. They really are, but they don't know how to do that. Let's get parliamentarians. Let's get women in their communities with us, as they have done in New Zealand, for example. And then let's prepare our educational settings. Let's make sure they have water sanitation, that the practice settings are good, that they have clinical mentors. Let's make sure our faculty who haven't had any updates for 30 years know what they're doing. And then let's look at the standards in countries and let's, I, I'm sharing those UK NMC standards with everybody. Let's use standards like that to lift our, our, our targets. And then let's develop curricula. In Malawi, they need stuff on uh, PMTCT for malaria, um, TB, uh, you know, those are the big issues there. M more die from malaria, TB, and, and HIV than anything else. So we have to adapt our curriculum, oopsie, to, to what we need. Then let's educate. And most importantly, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. We have never monitored, evaluated, or reviewed our midwifery programs. We cannot budget. We, we, we have just said we need more, but we haven't said, well, how much would that cost? What would the economic gain be? How long will it take? What will our objectives be? So... We have to do all of this together, act, monitor, and review. And that cycle, I'm not going to go through this in detail. You will see this. It's to be published. This is the first ever global, with UNFPA, UNICEF, ICM, results framework for strengthening midwifery education. You'll see the seven steps down the left. You'll see activities, output, short-term outcomes, long-term outcomes. If you just look at the top right, if we can strengthen leadership and policy, we are looking to increase investment and strengthening international standard midwifery education globally. So at last now, we can start to say, we don't have that, where are we? Let's measure it, let's improve it. And we have programmatic measures. So I'll leave you to look in, in detail at those. When it's published, I'll let you know. COVID is still a problem, and I take my hat off to every single one of you who have worked so hard through this and gone way over your ordinary length of day to, to help women and babies. But we have now started to move into five countries to implement the seven steps. The countries, it seems a bit of an odd group, um, but they were chosen by, um, by the region, the regional offices, and the criteria that the ministry are interested, we have the capacity to move, and that UNICEF, UNFPA, and, U and ICM are able to support us here. So we're just starting with leadership policy, getting that data and evidence, and on the monitoring, because those are huge issues. And we've got a lot of discussions going on. I just want to share with you some of the really exciting things that have happened just in the last few months. I haven't been able to travel yet. I'm hoping next year I'll actually be able to go and, and support them and work with them. But Pakistan has completely blown me away. No midwives for decades, 80% um, obstetrician, the 20 other percent don't get anything. So you have a traditional birth attendant or nobody at home, or you have to have money and find an obstetrician. You can imagine what that's like in, in the rural parts of Pakistan. So within weeks of us starting, the Ministry of Health, supported by WHO, held a multi-stakeholder meeting and said, right, we're going to have a national strategy for midwifery for Pakistan. It's like, what? This is amazing. We're now going to have a card of midwives in Pakistan led by ministry. Private sectors, for the first time, are really coming aboard, recognising how important it is. It's about 50-50 public-private, but, but we're looking for resources from private. They're so interested. I'm really pleased to say 
instead of an expensive consultancy company, it's the Midwifery Association of Pakistan um, that are doing this work for WHO. We're funding them. And some of you will know Dr. Rafat Jan from Pakistan, extraordinary professor at Aga Khan and a hugely influential ministry. She's going to be working with us on that. And they have work plans and incredible work in such a short time by such a few people. Sierra Leone, the other country, they're moving to develop a leadership assessment tool because guess what? We don't know how to assess midwifery leadership. We've been talking about it. So we're getting a group of experts together. We're thinking about what this would look like. We're co-designing this tool across the five countries and it will be shared uh, globally and used, we hope, you know, UNFPA, ICM and our other partners. Also, the Chief Nursing Midwifery Officer of Sierra Leone said, I don't want another situational analysis on midwifery. I want an online tool that I can update every year on what is going on in midwifery. So lots of exciting things happening in Sierra Leone. India, many of you will heard quite a lot of what's happening there. They introduced the midwifery card three years ago, a huge launch by the Prime Minister at the partnership, big global thing. Uh, but the challenges in India are huge also. We've had the, the COVID, as you can imagine, you knew what happened in India. Everything came to a stop. They had to focus on that. But India has about 25 states. It's huge. Each state is about the population of the UK. So there's a focus on six states, very strong min Ministry of Health leadership, but a lot going on. So, so there have been delays. It's really picking up again now um, after COVID, although that's still an issue, of course. Of course, India has been led by obstetrician for decades. And women expect it and obstetricians expect it. To change this to a midwifery-led model, it's tough. But it's happening, and we're building the confidence of obstetricians in these states, so good stuff. Again, in a, in a country like India or Nigeria, the government can put out a strategy. States don't have to follow it. So we're having to really look again. The Indian Nursing Council have accepted the new scope of work just for midwives, which is huge progress. But we don't know that all the states we're working in with. So lots of issues um, going and it's, as you can see a lot of public private sector in India as well so now just on to the third one and I'm going to keep charging through all of this um, how do we look at midwife led we you know I loved hearing uh, Jackie and Verena talking about um, midwife continuity of care continuity of carer I hope all of you have seen this um, Cochrane database uh, systematic review from Jane Sandal led by midwife as well as um, Hora Sultani and this has been absolutely uh, groundbreaking and is changing huge amount of thinking, certainly in WHO, but amongst any many partners. And as you saw, it's, it was one of the four recommendations. And this is the evidence that showed it. If you look at the evidence at the bottom, this arrow that goes to 24% less likely to experience a preterm birth. Now, the challenge for me is if we could have a vaccine that would prevent 24% of preterm birth, the Global Alliance for Vaccines Initiative, the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Fund, this hopefully the UK government would throw money at that vaccine to save one in four babies um, from stillbirth. But what we have is midwifery, much more complex relational based in the system. So we're working on how do we now move this forward? This came from high income countries. You can see much greater satisfaction for women. So the first thing we did is we got this recommendation into WHO guidelines. I hope you, I hope you know how to find these and where to find them, but, but please do look at them. They've become much more user-friendly and women-friendly. So we have recommendations of antenatal care for positive pregnancy experience, intrapartum care for positive childbirth experience. I'm really pleased to say that a new postnatal guideline will come out next year for positive postnatal experience for mother and baby. And we had Sue Down led a huge piece of work with WHO to make sure we have this recommendation on midwife-led care within those guidelines. So it is there, this is the recommendation in which a known midwife or small group of known midwives supports a woman throughout antenatal, postnatal, sorry, childbirth, postnatal. But see in red, it's in settings with well-functioning midwifery programs. Now we haven't defined that. And the, the big challenge for us in WHO now is to move forward on this. We want, we want our DG to stand up in a couple of years at the World Health Assembly and say, ministers, without a doubt, this is where we need to be going. But we don't have the evidence from low and middle income countries where they don't have what we would call in the UK a well-functioning programme, for example. Not just low- and middle-income countries, large parts of the US um, and the Americas and, and um, wealthy states in the Middle Eastern region don't have this. Um, so it is a context-specific recommendation. We have developed um, a theory of change as to what are the mechanisms behind these fantastic results. We don't really understand 
why or how it works. We're going out to consultation on that over the next couple of months. And then we will be publishing the theory of change of all the assumptions. You have to have the politics right, society right, the education right. The whole thing has to be there. And um, so we a lot of work on that. And we're doing a review of who is doing what. There's some very interesting work in, 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 in other countries now outside of the um, Cochrane Review coming up. And we hope to have another Cochrane Review on the evidence, but also on implementation. So watch that space. That's going to be huge over the next while. I'm just getting to the last one now. Um, on leadership. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm going way over time. I'm going to go through this so fast. Please look at the midwives' voices, midwives' reality. This was 200, two and a half thousand midwives responded. We had to stop the survey, but really it's about gender inequality. I won't go through this slide, but you can see the sociocultural ill, um, economic and professional barriers um, for midwives, the gender penalty. 37% midwives feel unsafe. This is a really great paper about the tip of the iceberg um, you know, what's going on? There's so much violence against female health workers. We have to look underneath. It is about power. You as students now talk about power, gender hierarchies of power. Don't be shy. We've got to move this forward. It's out in the open. No more hiding it. When we look at midwives and leadership, everything we see online is about birth, not about research, education and management. We have a, 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 a whole document on Government Chief Nursing Midwifery Office, we're finding they are isolated, unable to do what they're meant to do. Fantastic, Jackie's going to speak to you later. She's an absolute star and they all look up to her. And this is um, Georgia Carter's in Bolivia as well. But you can see half of them are invisible, don't have a laptop, aren't there at meetings, not seen as part of government. So these are the recommendations. And the one I want you to look at is that it's an essential element of your education and training. We were trained in, in my generation in leadership you are all leaders as students and your voice must be heard. So really pleased to see that that's part of the new NMC standards as well. Absolutely fantastic. This is a new WHO community of practice. We are connecting people, leaders from Sierra Leone to Malawi to India, to, to let them talk to each other and say, how do I do this PowerPoint? I don't know how to do a budget. Do you know the latest evidence? What can I say to my minister? Support each other. It's the only way forward. We've got the new global strategic directions. Again, education, leadership, service delivery and jobs coming up. I'm very close to the end. I'm really pleased to say in WHO that the contribution of midwives to global commitments is increasingly recognised and universal health coverage is the big hot topic now. We've got to reach the most vulnerable and the ones who've been left behind. And midwives are there all the way through in primary health care. And this year is actually the year of the health and care worker. So again, more focus. I won't go through this slide in detail, but something that's been missing, again, I was so pleased to hear Jackie and Verena talk about it, is human rights. There are four human rights treaties in existence for sexual, reproductive, maternal, newborn and child health. Um, the Convention of the Rights of the Child, Convention on Eliminations of All Forms of Discrimination, the International Covenants on Civil and Political Rights and Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. All midwives and all women need to know their rights um, to, to prevent this, the mistreatment of women in, in so many places. So I won't go through them. It means that education needs to include this, but we are developing an essential respectful care module. And we talk through all of these um, rights in the form of women. What does it feel like for them? What was their experience? What would you do about it? How can you uphold your rights and their rights? So that's coming soon. So watch that space. Can't finish without mentioning COVID and, and just always huge respect for everything midwives have done this year. But the SOMI said, the COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated the global shortage of 900,000 midwives, with the health needs of women and newborns being overshadowed, midwifery services being disrupted, and midwives being deployed to other services. That has to stop. We started a piece of work which has to be published soon on how we can support education during COVID. We took the seven steps. Mary Renfrew led on this with me, uh, and it's me. I'm guilty of not getting this published yet. But if you look at the bottom, it's about collaboration leadership. It's about equity, making sure all midwives have access to education during COVID. It's about their safety and the safety of women and newborns. And most of all, it's about a focus on students and students' voices in their education during the COVID. So we've been listening to you and you'll see a lot of that incorporated. My last slide here is please get this app. WHO updates this about two to three times a week. It's completely free. And everything you need to know about COVID and maternal newborn health, sexual reproductive health is on that app. And I'm going to stop there and thank you for listening to this roller coaster of information. I hope you've got loads of challenges. 
in your head and that you can think about your education as you go forward and really taking on these challenges to help us overcome this injustice and make sure that women aren't being left the way they are um, without care and being mistreated and that there's so much positive about midwifery that we have to get out there. So thanks to all of you and good luck. I'll be thinking of you.